Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. This is the Farm All 856 Restoration, Episode 7. In this episode, step by step, I'm going to reassemble this transmission case, including the torque amplifier. All of my parts have come. They're in big boxes in the room behind me. I ordered everything for this stage of the project from Red Run Wright in Wisconsin, who I find to be a great resource for advice on this vintage of tractors, as well as parts. The torque amplifier that I bought from Red Run Wright was manufactured or rebuilt by High Capacity in Iowa. It's a heavy duty torque amplifier and we're all set to go here. All these pieces are gonna wind up in this case by the time we're done with this video. Step one is to assemble the quill gear on its bearing and into its retainer. And I have a new quill gear here because remember I had wear on my old one here where the clutches rode. These are the direct drive clutches in the TA. And something that's interesting, you can see that there were three clutch plates riding on this. There's three indentations in the teeth. The new TA that I have is a heavy duty TA and one of the things that makes it heavy duty is it's got four direct drive clutch plates instead of the three that were in the old one for a longer life. This quill gear came with new needle bearings inside of it. And step one is to reassemble the bearing onto it. Next seal gear goes back on the humped face on the gear here. The extended flange goes down toward the bearing. And then we have a snap ring that I can use my new set of snap ring pliers on. I bought a couple sets of these off that big river company. And then a viewer sent me some more sets. So I think I'm good for snap ring pliers now. This is Luber Plate 105 engine assembly lube. I like to use it in transmissions. I'm just going to coat all the bearings as I assemble it together with a little bit of this just to make sure they roll all right until it's filled with Hytran. This housing goes upside down. Quill gear goes inside. Was easy. I'm going to lube these needle bearings in here a little bit too. Here's my new remanufactured torque amplifier. Some differences compared to the old torque amplifiers. I said in the direct drive end here you can see there's four clutch plates in there instead of the original three. And then the sprag clutch in here is one inch wide sprags instead of three quarters out of the original torque amplifiers. Now these aren't built new from scratch. These are remanufactured. So some pieces are reused, remachined, whatever. And one thing I noticed is, remember my old TA had a pilot bearing that had worn the shaft. Well, they knurled this one. They probably knurled it and then machined it to get it just right. The other thing to note is these TAs come with a hose clamp wrapped around the, the input shaft here to hold it all together until you get it in place. I'm going to use the transmission case as kind of my workbench here to put the quill gear onto this. If you look down here at the direct drive clutches, you got to line them all up to get the quill gear in. So I just have an old screwdriver shaft here that I'm using to kind of push them generally into alignment. Once they're kind of roughly aligned, you can take the old quill gear and set it in there and use that to do final alignment. Well, you got all screwed up again. One, two, three. Number four, you're kind of stubborn. The hard part is not aligning the clutches to each other, it's getting them centered on the shaft here. But I like doing things like this, so no worries. Alrighty, I think I found an easier way to do this. I took the bottom needle bearing out of the quill so that I had more, a little more slop to align things. There we go. Now, nope. make sure to catch the fourth, and there's all four of them in there. So now we can center them. 
Here's how far it is in with all four clutches engaged. The trick yeah, is that that fourth clutch is way down and sits on the very end of the shaft, so you got to make sure you catch it. I feel like Indiana Jones. She's in there all the way. Yep. Awesome. Now that I got it all together, I don't want it to come apart when I turn it the other way around, so I'm going to use fender washer, a bunch of washers on a bolt, screwed into the end of the shaft here, hold it together during installation. Next, this big needle bearing that I pulled out to clean the case needs to go back into its home. Now it's time to lower the new TA into the case and check the end play. The TA is just setting in there. The top flange of the TA is taking the weight of the TA onto the case. And then you check down and the quill gear housing here should rotate. And it does. It's against the bottom baffle here, but it's free. I'm going to put these front bolts in and snug them down to approximate torque and feel torque. While well, checking to make sure that the quill gear housing still rotates, nothing's binding. Now I've flipped the case over onto the opposite end so the rear of the case is facing up. And coming into the back end of the TA, here's the quill gear. I'm going to need two hands, but I'm going to loosen this up a little bit. These stay loose for now. I'm setting up a dial indicator in here so I can measure end play on the TA. With the dial indicator zeroed, I can draw down these bolts. Hmm. Play is supposed to be five to twenty-five thousandths. I only have one. The old TA did not have a shim in it when I took it apart. The shim goes on the underside of this baffle here between the baffle and the quill housing. And when you get a new TA, they provide some different thickness paper shims in case you need them. But I am too tight. I'm not going to need a shim unless I figure out what's going on here. Wiggle everything around make sure it's all settled in where it's supposed to be. Let's try it again. Nothing. But it rotates just fine. I got on the horn with Joe Schmidt from Red Run Right who has done hundreds of these TAs and told him what I had. I've got a thousandths of end play, but when the bolts are out on the quill housing, you can rotate the, the quill housing freely. And even when you have bolts tightened down in here, everything rotates freely. But the spec was, as you know, five to 25 thousandths. And he said, you're fine. And the reasoning behind that is because this old TA, which I've got on the table here for display, has three clutches in the rear of it. And so the quill shaft that goes in is where you're measuring that play, that end play. You want the, the quill shaft 
five to 25 thousandths. The reason is that you don't want it any more than that because the fourth clutch that's way down in here, if that shaft has too much end play, it'll come disengaged from the fourth clutch plate way down inside. So really what they're looking for is not too much end play. As long as I have a free rotation and it's not binding, then I'm all right. Now, it's interesting what you learn when you start talking to somebody who's done so much, so many of these. High capacity puts a 30,000 shim washer underneath a snap ring in here. So if you do run into a situation where your TA is just too long and it binds when you put it in the case, you can take this snap ring out under here, pull out the 30,000 shim washer, put the snap ring back on, and then shim the TA to the proper end play clearance using the paper shims that came with it. See here looking at the old TA, the direct drive clutches here, you'll see there's three clutch discs down in there. That snap ring that you see down at the bottom, they put in that spacer underneath that snap ring. In case you run into a bind, literally, with your TA. The other thing that I learned that's really fascinating is I've seen some and read some about some guys measuring end play on the pilot bearing end of the TA on this opposite end here. I said, well, Joe, how can that work because you're really where you're getting the play is in the quill at this end. There's nothing in here that's gonna make this end, this end of the shaft have play except if there's wear in the internal components of the TA that would contribute to end play on this end. He's had discussions with high capacity to change their instructions because they their instructions say to measure it from the pilot bearing end, but you're really not getting anything out of that. You really want to know what the end play is here at this end to make sure everything stays engaged with the clutches. It's fascinating when you get into these things. Now that we got that situation resolved, <laughs> I can take out my dial indicator and flip this thing over and we can start the permanent installation of the torque amplifier. Tilt this back up the other way and then pull the PA, put the O-ring on it, torque it back in, permanent. The soldering came with the TA cap and it goes up and on to the underside of the front flange. Grease it up good, of course, first. Blue Loctite on these guys. Looks like I'm going to have to go out and get some more Blue Loctite. Now with the case turned back horizontal, we can hook in the rear bolts of the cool cage that go through this baffle. I put some blue Loctite on these as well, even though they've got lock plates. Belt and suspenders. Now our holder can come off for good. <laughs> yeah, good rotation. Do, 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 do. Can't forget this with the torque amplifier all secured, we can take this hose clamp off of the front. There we go. The next job is to put these three hydraulic jumper tubes in that go from the MCV to the torque amplifier. And to put those in, I got to find the right O rings for them. This is my MCV slash torque amplifier gasket kit. And we have a whole bunch of O-rings. Looks like that one right there. I would say that's a winner. I'm going to put one O-ring on each of them to begin with. 
I'm using grease instead of Hytran because I just feel more comfortable with them sliding through the bores with something that'll stick onto them a little better and spread out. Set the first one in. These aren't bore specific, so you don't need to keep track of which one came out of where. I'm going to put the other two over here for now. And I can slide the other O-ring onto the bottom of the tube, and that way it doesn't have to pass through two bores. Where did you go? Oh, he fell out. It was still on my finger. Old man. I'm abandoning that idea and putting them in this way instead. It'll be fine. Number two. Oh, got that one in. Number three. Mechanical work is simple, right? To reassemble things, you just reverse what you did for disassembly. If you can remember all the pieces, the next thing I have to do is put in the transmission counter shaft, which is this spline shaft. It goes in the lower part of the transmission, you remember. And it's really got two primary parts to it. First, you've got the, the two constant mesh gears that engage with the two gears in the torque amplifier. And the first one here is the torque amplifier driven gear. The TA drives this gear when you're in TA mode. And remember, I had to get this, this gear supplied with the TA to make sure that it meshed properly with the TA that I got. And then we have a spacer that goes between the two. It's the long spacer of the set on the shaft. And then we've got the direct drive gear, which runs off of that quill gear, the same as the quill um, that I put in. And it has the transmission brake on it too when everything is together. I removed this from the front when I disassembled, so we put it back in from the front. And it goes through that needle bearing. And it should have a bit of clearance. Now from this side, we can put in the TA gear. And it only goes in one way. You can only fit it in one way, because if you put it in this way, the snout that sticks out means it won't engage with the torque amplifier. It's nice when things work out that way. So it goes in this way. And we have to kind of fit it together as we slide the shaft through. We'll get on there. Did you wake up today and think I'm going to be stubborn? Is that the problem? You certainly don't want to go on there. You just need to get started, I expect. I'll tap on it with a rubber mallet. Next, the spacer goes on. Next, the direct drive gear goes in. And I might have to put this in from the other side, I'm not sure. Maneuver that gear around to where it's supposed to be. Slide the counter shaft back to catch the gear. Have the gear fall off and do it all over again. Ha! It's through! The second part of this delightful exercise is to put in the drive gears that actually go in what you would normally consider the transmission on the counter shaft. They're called the first, the second, and the third drive gear. Not that that has anything to do with what gear they're actually going into. That's just the way they go on the shaft. And they're called drive gears because the counter shaft is actually driving the tractor. Power comes from the flywheel through the torque amplifier, gets transmitted from the tank, torque amplifier down to the counter shaft via one of the two constant mesh gears, whichever one the clutches are engaged on, either the direct drive or the TA gear on the counter shaft. Power comes down through the counter shaft back to drive these three gears. And these three gears, one, whichever ones are engaged, depending on the gear shift, in turn, transmit power up to the transmission main shaft and back to the range transmission. You got all that? There's going to be a test at the end of the video. <laughs> anyway, we got to get them with their spacers on in the correct orientation. I'm showing you a close-up. You're looking down from the top, what would be the top of the transmission as I put the counter shaft gears and spacers on. The first thing that goes on is a spacer. And then we have the third speed drive gear. The camphor, chamfer, however you pronounce it, goes toward the front of the tractor.
And then we have the second drive gear. Chamfer goes to the back on that one. And then we have another spacer. Here's the first driven gear. Chamfer goes toward the front on that, and it should be kind of a tight fit if I'm in the right spot. You gotta get it on there. You can barely see or feel things. <laughs> lucky, lucky, I can't see it, but I got it in there. Now if we look in the case, here's the MCV, and you can see the torque amplifier right up in there. There's the first constant mesh gear. That's the end of the counter shaft that I put in. It's gotta come in pretty much flush, the needle bearings in this baffle here. And then the PTO driven gear will go in here later on. Before I put the rear bearing onto this lower counter shaft, I wanna bring it through the case enough where I think I can seat it on the counter shaft and in its bore at the same time. There we go. Now the counter shaft is seated and hopefully That'll keep me from having to align it with the bearing as I'm pushing the shaft through, because that's not very easy. And it looks like my plan's gonna work here. I think I just have to hold on to the far end of it while I give the bearing some taps. I should have put this retainer on before I started bringing the shaft back. And I'm out of blue Loctite, so I'm going to have to back out these bolts and put Loctite on them after I go and get some. Another day. I'm counting on you all to remind me that these need to come out and go back in with Loctite. Or else I'll forget. The counter shaft came ahead a little bit when I did that, so... I'm gonna tap it back again so it seats where it's supposed to, and then we can check the gear positions. That is seated. With all the drive gears from the TA in, you wanna check mesh. So this is the TA constant mesh gear, and there's the TA up there. It's not centered on the gear, but it's fully engaged with the gear, so we are okay. You also may wind up with situations sometimes where you get this gear running too close to this baffle with the danger of hitting it. And high capacity provides shims for the counter shaft that go in the shaft counter shaft so you can shift these gears around. But in my case, you really don't need it. We're in fine shape. The second TA drive gear is way up in there where my ring finger is pointing. And it's centered as well, as far as I can see. It's very hard to see up in there. Remember, that's on the quill gear, and that's a direct drive gear that it's meshing with. It certainly turns nicely, and there's no binding or tough spots, so that's a very good sign. We're down to the easy part now, putting the main shaft in the transmission, and just like the counter shaft, you gotta put the gears on as you slide the shaft in. The shaft goes in from the rear, the same way we pulled it out. First, we've got these two gears. And we've got this gear. Camphor, chamfer, whatever, to the back. Before I put this together, I want to show you something. See that needle bearing down there? This is the back end of the quill gear. And there's a needle bearing in there that engages the nose of the main shaft. Now, these two shafts rotate independently of each other because they're separated by a bearing except when this front gear here is engaged with the quill gear like that. <laughs> like that. The shifting fork in this collar here will push that in and that's direct drive right through there. These two gears on the main shaft both have shift collars in them that the forks go into. So you slide them back and forth to engage whatever gear you select. And of course with that gear out and that gear over there, you're in direct drive. 
And the rear here is where the main shaft bolts in and there is an alignment to these. This cutout goes to the bottom. And then on the retainer plate here, this cutout goes to the bottom as well. And then you've got a horseshoe shaped shim which will vary by tractor to shim the shaft to the correct position that goes in behind it. Get everything lined up here. I'll have to remove these bolts too to put some blue Loctite on them, so add that to your reminder list. Finally, we have the counter shaft nut to take care of, and to do that, I'm gonna flip this over a little bit. I'm gonna lock this in two gears at once so that it's locked up tight. A new washer with a locking tab that seats into the counter shaft came with the high capacity kit and I'm going to grease up that washer on the face that the nut goes on to so that it doesn't bind on the washer when I turn the nut in. I'm going to coat the threads of this nut with red Loctite. The strong stuff, the guy after me is going to have to watch this video to know to heat it up to get this off. I'm making do with what I have here, which is a flat pipe wrench. I don't have a socket this big. Torque spec for this nut is as tight as you can get it with a four foot bar. And then after it's as tight as you can get it, just a little bit tighter. Now I can fold over this tab on the washer. Belt and suspenders again. Remember that counter shaft nut was loose when I took this all apart. And that's a common problem with the 56 series and later even. International Harvester went to a left-handed thread nut later on. I don't know if it was the 66s or the 86s. It didn't really remedy the problem, changing the thread direction on the nut, because the real problem is, is this transmission gets stressed under load. That counter shaft is so long and it's got so many spacers in it, those big long tube spacers, that as it flexed under load, as the gears were trying to come apart between the main shaft and the counter shaft under load, those spacers would wind up wearing on their ends. And so play would develop in that shaft and therefore you have the nut loose on the end after thousands of hours. What I did was to tighten it as much as I could to pull those gears in tight to the spacers and that's pretty much all you can do. High capacity doesn't say to do it the way that I did it. The instructions say to drill that nut for an eighth inch spring pin and then drill the shaft and put the spring pin through both for a mechanical connection. I happen to believe that red Loctite probably is just as strong and the real problem with the high capacity instructions is they say to kind of tighten that nut some, then back it off, then tighten it, but not too tight. And the reason that they say that is because if you tighten it as I did, you're gonna change uh, just by a hair the position of the gears on the counter shaft respective to the gears on the main shaft, and you're gonna get a little more gear noise for a while until the gears settle into that slightly new position, which I'm fine with. I don't want that nut running loose. I don't want those spacers running loose inside. Final thing regarding this darn nut. There are multiple ways that folks use to keep it tight. And I used red Loctite in folding the tab over, but I have seen people put a tack weld between the shaft and the nut to kind of weld the two together with the thought that if you ever take it apart, you can just grind away that little piece of weld and take it off. 
Some people will stave in a portion of the nut into the keyway on the shaft to provide a mechanical connection. I talked about pegging the two together with a spring pin. This is just the method that I was most comfortable with. So there you have it, installing a TA, reassembling the transmission. Very common job for this series and later of tractors. I tried to present this video for somebody that would be doing it themselves with lots of detail. And toward that end, I think you need to understand how things work in order to assemble them properly. It's more than just changing out parts. I got two appendices for this video. Number one is about adjusting end play, and number two is a diagram of how power flows through this transmission. You're welcome to hang around for both of those, or you can leave now. It's up to you. In any case, I thank you very much for watching this video, and I'll see you next time when we hang this thing back on the tractor. Appendix one, the easy thing, measuring end play. Earlier I stated that you really should be measuring end play from the quill gear back here because what you're concerned about is how much this can move back and forth in the clutch pack in here so that it doesn't lose the fourth innermost clutch if there's too much end play. And I made a statement about not measuring end play up at the pilot bearing up here, up at the pilot bearing end. Remember this is forward on the TA. What I realized after further thought is you can measure it that way. It's just a little bit more difficult to get an accurate reading because if you're measuring that way, you have the TA bolted in here to the, to the bell housing and you have this quill gear fixed in its retainer in the back. You want that bolted in and your dial indicator on the front of this shaft here and the movement you're going to get that you're going to measure is going to be this case here because it's fixed sliding <laughs> in and out of the sprag clutch just not that far that the sprags fall out you're going to get that same reading but the point of end play is actually back here where the quill gear comes in and if you're measuring at the front you're just getting that reading a different way you're moving this assembly back and forth along with the quill whereas if you're measuring it in the back you're just moving the quill back and forth in any case the important thing about end play is end play in the quill not in any of the rest of this assembly appendix two power flow from the engine through the transmission and this is really the key to understanding how this torque amplifier and transmission work together. I'm going to draw a diagram here of how it flows because it's easy to understand it I think with a diagram. If that's the front of the tractor, here we have the back side of the engine. This is the engine flywheel. Coming into the flywheel is the input shaft of the torque amplifier. That thing that pokes out of the bell housing you've been seeing the whole video. It seats into a pilot bushing in the flywheel and then there's a clutch here, but I'm not even going to draw that because that's outside the point. Now, as this comes back into the transmission bell housing here, the first thing you encounter is the hydraulic supply that comes in the side of the torque amplifier. Then you have, and I'm not going to get this anatomy completely correct, but it's fine for diagramming purposes. You have a gear in the torque amplifier here. That gear is connected to both a two disc hydraulic clutch pack and a one way sprag clutch that are connected to this gear and this is the torque amplifier gear. In other words when you have this set to gear reduction you're traveling in TA mode this gear is driving the rest of the gear set. Behind this clutch pack you have another clutch pack that is the direct drive clutch pack and that's the one in my HDTA that's got four clutch plates in it. So we're going to call this the direct drive pack and this over here is the TA pack. Connected to this is another gear and this is part of that quill gear that I put in. And that quill gear is driven by these clutches. When these clutches are engaged tight together it drives this quill gear. Now if we go down to the counter shaft down here that goes all the way back into the transmission we have first of all, and this is way out of scale, but we've got a gear that meshes 
with the TA gear here. So when this clutch pack is engaged, this gear is powering this gear, which is rotating the counter shaft. Connected to the direct drive clutch pack, we have another gear, which is a direct drive gear. So when this clutch pack is engaged, this gear gets driven, this gear kind of freewheels because the clutches are disengaged, and this does the driving. So it's either one gear or the other, depending on whether you're in direct drive or TA, that's driving the counter shaft. The other one is essentially freewheeling in the TA. Coming back here further, and I got this wrong when I first explained it, we have the gear sets that go on in what we would normally call the transmission case. What we think of when we say transmission. First we've got a big gear, and that really is the third gear. That's third gear of the fourth gear, four gear transmission. We've got a second gear, and we've got a first gear. Now these are drive gears. They're called drive gears because the counter shaft is transmitting power through them. They're driving another gear, so they're drive gears. Up here, completely separate from the torque amplifier, we have the main transmission shaft. And on this shaft, we've got, <laughs> I'm going to confuse terminology here, but also a direct drive gear. And that gear, when you push it ahead, it's a sliding gear set, will engage directly with this quill gear. It seats inside of it. I showed you it seats into the needle bearing here. Now if we walk through the different gears on the main shaft and what happens, let's do the easy ones first. We have a set of gears here that mesh and there's one back here, and they slide back and forth to engage first, second, and third gear on this shaft. And this sh main shaft winds up running back to the range transmission here, where you can shift low, high, reverse, and neutral. This, so this gear and these sets of gears slide between these three gears to create three speeds. Let's look at the special case of direct drive. So when you're in direct drive, this sliding gear set on the main shaft slides back and engages with the quill gear on the TA. When the TA is in also in direct drive, then essentially you have power flowing straight through all the way from the flywheel all along the shaft. And the counter shaft really isn't doing anything because these two gears are disengaged. It's being driven directly from this gear. When you have this gear set slid in for direct drive and the TA is engaged, when this clutch pack is engaged, then this gear is driving this gear on the counter shaft. It's coming back up, and this gear, remember, is fixed to the counter shaft. It's coming back up and driving the end of the twill, quill gear, even though the clutch pack is disengaged, and in turn driving this through to the range transmission. It takes a while to figure all this stuff out, and I had to do a lot of research, both online, looking at forum posts, looking through blue ribbon service manuals, talking to the supplier, to come to my own understanding of how the TA works. I'm, I couldn't take one apart and put it back together. I'm still a little fuzzy on exactly how the sprag, the sprag clutch works. My understanding is that if the TA were just two clutch packs, one engaged for direct drive and one engaged for torque amplifier. When you slid the selector from one to the other and one clutch was tightening up and the other was releasing, you have a momentary point in time where you're kind of in neutral and you've got clutches that are slipping and you get a lot of wear on TA. In fact, I think International Harvester tried this sort of TA once and it didn't have a very long life. So the function of the Sprague clutch is to lock things up so that until the clutches are at pressure, at hydraulic pressure and completely closed, you don't get slippage. That's my understanding anyway. They also came up with a mechanical diode type of TA that sensed hydraulic pressure, I think, before switching to one clutch pack or the other so that you didn't get that slippage. That didn't work out well either. And then later on, International Harvester went to an electronically sensed TA pack where you it would sense when pressure had built on one clutch pack or the other and do the switch then. Because the issue always was, 
that the sprags wear out. And so they, I think they were trying to figure out ways to eliminate the sprag to get the TA through that momentary point in neutral without slipping the clutches. That's my understanding anyway. If any of you have more information or better information or clearer ways to explain it than I do, please do so in the comments section. I'm giving it to you the way that I have learned it and the way that I've come to understand it to put the assembly back together. And that concludes my two appendices. I hope they were helpful. And for those of you that stuck around, I thank you very much. And I'll see you next time.